I was watching videos of you delivering your your speeches, and I was watching uh, Paul Bakurita, and uh, I was watching a whole yeah. bunch of other people. Yeah. Um, right. And it occurred to me that if I meditate and imagine myself um, walking and using my arm again, that right. that will begin the process, and it will be then not unfamiliar when I get down to the floor and right. start the walking. Right. Right. How does meditation and imagining oneself walking actually change the brain? Does it actually change the brain? This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Bill from recoveryafterstroke.com. This is episode 108 and my guest today is Dr. Michael Merzenich, often referred to as the father of neuroplasticity in his early career, Dr. Michael Merzenich was part of the team that developed the earlier practical prosthetic device models that later became commercially known as the cochlear implant that helps deaf people hear. In the early 1990s, Dr. Merzenich set out to find applications for his team's research findings that the brain was in fact able to change and devise a program to help neurologically struggling children and adults. Dr. Merzenich is the founder of Brain HQ. The brain trading application, helping people enhance their brain function, and his most recent book is called Soft Wired, How the Science of Brain Plasticity Can Change Your Life. In the interview, I will ask Dr. Merzenich about how neuroplasticity can be used to support people that are recovering from brain injury and specifically after stroke. Now, when you get to the end of this episode, whether you are watching on YouTube or listening on your favorite podcast app, please do me a favor and share this episode in other groups that you hang out in. This will help someone that is doing it tough at the moment perhaps feel a little better about the journey that they are on. And also, if you feel that this podcast makes a massive difference to you and the stroke community, please do me a favor and give the show a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you download podcasts from. Now it's on with the show. I actually didn't realize that you were Lebanese. Well, I'm not, I'm not Lebanese. I don't know where you, I'm from Lebanon, Oregon, and that's a strange way of being Lebanese. And it was named Lebanon because there were cedar trees down by the river, you know, which of course Lebanon is famous for. And uh, but my wife did spend two years at the university at the American University in Beirut, so I'm sort of Lebanese by adoption. <laughs> <laughs> I found it very interesting when I was reading your bio. I thought it was a really funny thing to start the uh, interview with. That's a, that's a pretty yeah. cool, cool, cool little thing. Yeah, okay. So your early research apprenticeship was, at the time, uh, with one of the world's strongest auditory groups at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. The right. task at hand was to define the fundamental nature of functional organization of the central auditory and somatosensory nervous system. Why do you feel that this was an important definition to achieve? What were the lead researchers thinking? Well, I was interested in the, in the, the origins of the higher functions of the brain. And at that point, the understanding of the basic way that brain systems were organized was so primitive that it was very difficult to understand how to get to the real questions which are the basis of perception, the basis of sensation, the basis of cognition. And so just to understand how the machine was working, how the, how the brain was operating, encoding information and translating information into action was, uh, was so poorly understood that we knew we needed to gra have a better grounding. And uh, so these studies did lead to a better understanding of how the brain was actually uh, taking in information from the ear, from hearing, or from the skin, from, from somatic sensation, and translating it level by level and interpreting it, and then basically using it to control its action, the production of speech or the production of vocalizations in animals or the, or the control of actions fed back from information from the body in the case of somatic sensation. So we did contribute to making that first level developing that first level understanding of how the brain is actually organized to do what it does. Wow, very important. And, uh, you, you know, you can see some of the implications as a result of that work, you know, right. what that led to. It's just amazing. Um, it, it's really fascinating to me that somebody was thinking about those things and trying to come up with solutions. It, it seems so obvious now, but at the time it would have been groundbreaking. 
Right. It, it, it was wide open then in the sense that the science was very primitively developed. And we really didn't know how the brain was organized. For example, there was a fundamental misunderstanding about the plasticity of the brain. Historically, it was imagined that the brain could change when you were a baby and it grew up, it matured, reached a mature state when you were maybe a year or two or three years of age. And from that point forward, it was like the computer on your desk. It was hardwired. Every element was fixed in its function. And really, the only way it had to change from that point forward was to go downhill because it had grown to a mature state. And it turns out that that, that was an incredible error. And so we now know that the brain and wheat is one thing that we contributed to the appreciation of the discovery of. We now know that the brain is, in fact, continuously changing itself. Mm. In fact, it's its big trick. It's continually remodeling itself as a function of how you live your life, how you engage it. And, uh, but at that point, our understanding of it was so limited, so primitive, that we did not understand that. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, it's such a great thing that the brain changes itself, and we'll get to that. Uh, in a right. little while, it's just um, it's my big uh, it's my big thing that I'm enjoying knowing that about my brain. Uh, yeah. In, in the uh, 70s and 80s, you led the research team that developed the early practical prosthetic device models that later evolved into a commercial multiple channel cochlear implant, right. and you helped to fill some knowledge gaps for surgeon Robin Mickelson in his understanding right. of the coding of sound and speech in the inner ear or auditory brain. And as a result, hearing was recovered for deaf people. Were, right. were you aware that these achievements at the time were challenging the broadly held conclusion that the brain was hardwired or did that come later? Well, we really didn't think of it in, in, in those terms. What we were trying to do, and I might say there were two other efforts in parallel. One was in Australia by scientists at the, uh, associated with the University of Melbourne, and one was in Austria. And in parallel, we each developed different strategies to encode speech. And our notion was is that we could represent speech well enough so that we could have prim a primitive level of understanding. Might, might expect that if everything worked well. But we were really trying to just deliver information into the brain the way the normal ear did in an accurate enough way so that the individual would understand that, that, that information, even though we knew that our ability to duplicate what the normal intact ear delivers to the brain would, was very crude. I liken it to playing Chopin with your fist. And, uh, and in fact, people didn't understand it initially, and it took the plasticity in the brain basically to make the devices work. They're often thought of as a sort of miracle of engineering, but actually they're a miracle of engineering and the plastic brain. And the plasticity of the brain is an absolute critical contributor to the successful application of cochlear implants because they don't understand usually what's that information at all initially. And the brain changes in a way that confers understanding. Wow. And so we began to appreciate as we were doing these experiments, but the only way we could really account for what was happening in these individuals was if their brain was plastic throughout life on a large scale. And, uh, and we began doing experiments that demonstrated that in other, in other venues. Yeah. Fabulous. What is it? Neural plasticity or neuroplasticity? Well, you can go either way. <laughs> Sometimes we call it plasticity, neuroplasticity. And, uh, well, it's irrelevant. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> um, you've been called the father or the godfather of neuro neuroplasticity for good reason. Um, I wonder who were some of the scientists and research that you learned from and based your research on? Well, actually, it's a little unfair because around, you know, if we look to the early part of the uh, 20th century and, in fact, even in the late 19th century, the predominant belief was that the brain was, in fact, changing itself as you acquired ability as you learned. And then we sort of lost sight of it in the mainstream of science. But there were always scientists from uh, physiological psychology, from the psychology side of science that believed that the brain was plastic. It's just that in the medical mainstream, 
the, 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 that notion was abandoned. You know, you could, you say, could say where people are doing the most careful experiments, they developed this religious idea that the brain was, in fact, hardwired. And uh, so uh, certainly we, we helped, you could say, make this correction. We did very specific, simple experiments that demonstrated the brain was changing itself if you manipulate its inputs, in, inputs from the skin or inputs from the ear, that when you train an animal in any skill, and it improves at that ability that you account for its improvement by changes in its brain. So, you, you, you know, that led to the understanding that the brain was continuously plastic. And we, we very early did experiments, Bill, in which we looked at animals near the end of life. Said, okay, this, this animal is expected to pass from this mortal coil within a few months or a year. And uh, is it just as changeable or is it? And we found to our delightful surprise that it was just as easy to modify its brain, almost as easy as in an animal in the prime of life or an early life. Mm. And you just had to make the conditions appropriate for the brain, the machinery of the brain, because what happens when the brain grows up in early childhood is it matures in its ability to control that change. And what it's doing is it initially doesn't have that much control because it's still primitive. And once it has that control, you could say it can limit change to the conditions in which the change is said to be good for it. But it's still powerfully plastic throughout life. I love what you said there. It was, you've got to make the right conditions to allow for the right type of change to occur. Right. No, no. The brain only, only changes when it matters to it is a simple way to think about it. Mm. And, as, and, and it changes very much as a function of how you're evaluating it and how engaged you are, mm. how attentive you are, how, how, how important it is to you. Mm. Uh, because that's actually controlling the machinery of the brain, which is controlling the, the rate of change and yeah. the extent of change. So in the case of somebody recovering from deficits after a stroke, if it's not important to them to recover, it's likely right. that they're going to have a longer, more, withdraw, more drawn out uh, you know, rate of recovery. And it's one of the biggest problems they have, Bill, because the brain is damaged and that it weakens the 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 uh, information that's fed to areas that are controlling your motivation. Mm. So you could say you're commonly demotivated as a function of the injury. And so it's a special struggle for such an individual. They have to they have to make a very special effort. Uh, and, you know, we have strategies in which we're trying to help them increase their motivation but uh, but uh, it's a struggle for them often to just get up for doing what they need to do to get better. So I wonder if if somebody had um, w w was able to be encouraged via things that they enjoyed doing, so something that their heart was in, so to speak. Right. Their heart being in a process of recovery right. or a ver the version of their recovery, if it was something that their heart was in, w right. w that would sort of could that possibly overcome those areas or, or support those areas of the brain that were damaged in the motivational side? Right. It, that's a really important question. Now, well, people have the, the, this discovered in rehabilitation, in fact, that if you go to things that are important to you, maybe things that relate to your former life's work, maybe things that relate to your, uh, the, the, the things in your family or in your extended relationship or friends that are the most important to you, you go to the hobbies that are the most important to you, most developed, that this is a very favorable avenue for you to begin to restore your ability. Because, and you're reinforced by all of those other things that were contributed, all of the richness of that historic experience and bringing the power to bear, you could say, on trying to drive change positively. So yes, that is a strategy that can be very helpful and can make a big difference in somebody trying to recover from brain injury. Yeah, amazing. I wonder, early on, how was your research received by your peers early on in your career? How is it? I didn't understand your question, Mel. So the research findings that you uh, were publishing how around neuroplasticity, how was that received by your peers? Was it a, a difficult uh, area to gain recognition in? Well, initially, there was skepticism because of the overwhelming belief in neuroscience was that the brain was just not plastic and 
as it grew up. And, uh, and it was so deeply embedded. In fact, a, a Nobel Prize had been awarded in the 1970s around this issue. It was regarded as one of the settled issues in, 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 in science, and it was broadly adopted in medicine. So, in fact, many neurologists today will tell you that plasticity is powerful in a baby and not powerful in an adult. Oh, wow. And uh, they still misunderstand its powers. Uh, I might say to the... Uh, to 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 the to to, to and, and their lack of understanding of it, in fact, is harmful to many people that are that could benefit from it. But initially, there was dismay. I mean, we were challenged at scientific meetings. People were very skeptical. But quite quickly, the evidence came to be overwhelming. And in fact, one of the easy experiments to do, Bill, in the in in the universe of of of, of science, is to engage a human or an animal in a in a learning progression in which they acquire a new ability or they improve at that ability. And if you do it all the appropriate experiment, the brain has to change. And it's, you, if you do the examine in the appropriate way, you will witness that change. And, and, and the change will account for, relate, clearly relate to the improvement of the ability. So it turned out that with over a period of five, six, seven years, the evidence became overwhelming. And now it is pretty universally agreed that the brain, in fact, is continually changing itself. And we understand the processes by which it changes its, itself in great detail. Yeah. What's really amazing is that um, and I'll talk about my experience with um, brain hemorrhage uh, as we continue as well, was that when I went to rehab, uh, the nurses and the physios and all the people that were involved in my recovery one of the first things they said to me was, oh, by the way, do you know about this thing called neuro neuroplasticity? And if people didn't, which there were many that didn't, um, that was the first thing that they told you about. Yeah, and I yeah, found that a yeah. fa fascinating approach because it was four years between my first experience with a, a hemorrhage and surgery. Um, so I had already read up on it and understood about it, but um, right. it was really great to hear that that's the approach they were taking you right. know, when uh, first... Uh, coming across their their new patient, right? No, no, that's great, and and that is in general. Uh, there's a general broad understanding that this is in play, and this is a path to restoration and recovery. Yeah, and uh, there's an increasingly intelligent understanding of how to drive changes. You could say to the benefit of a patient with individual needs, of the individual that's struggling, and uh, that's revolutionizing how we think about rehabilitative medicine. Yeah. In the early 1990s, your research findings began to be applied to help neurologically struggling children and adults. Right. What kind of challenges did you seek to apply neuroplasticity to in the early days? Well, we looked for a model. We knew, first of all, we knew that this had broad practical implications for it, and that there were, you know, millions, hundreds of millions of people that could benefit by the application of the science. So we looked for a target. And uh, I met a wonderful a psychologist who'd studied the deficits that children have when they struggle at school. And she'd focused on deficits, Paula Talao was her name, and she'd focus on deficits in language and reading. And she saw that most children that had, that struggled to learn to read had deficits in language. And that reading, because reading is a translation of, of listening, the sound parts of words that are meaning in words to their representation by letter. She appreciated that the majority of the children that struggled in school had an adequate representation in the listening domain. And that that needed to be clarified for, for the translation by letter in reading to make sense. So uh, in being aware of her work, and knowing that the kinds of deficits that she described as applied, applying to these children could almost certainly be impacted by training, we developed a model training program, took a series of these children in, in her laboratory that was in New Jersey, trained them. And these children are all, you know, not reading. If they were reading, it was way below grade level. Mm. They all had language impairments. We trained them. And after training, all of them were normal or above normal. And we, we realized that this would have very wide practical application, of course. So I went to the, my university and I said, look, we have, 
we have something that can potentially help many millions, hundreds of millions of children in the world. So how do we how do we get it to them in the world? And they helped me contribute to the foundation of a business. And uh, that business, which is called Scientific Learning Corporation, has now trained quite a few million children in the world who, who wouldn't be effective readers in a way that assured that they were effective readers. And basically it trained them as listeners and their listening accuracy. And that was the beginning. So, uh, but it was always imagined by us to be the beginning because we realized that there were many other applications of the science that there were many people that struggled for all kinds of reasons with psychiatric illness, people that had brains that were wounded, people who were losing it as they got older, all kinds of reasons. By engaging your brain to drive changes in your brain to, the, to its benefit, um, how managing your brain health was possible by using these strategies. And... Uh, so many, that's what I've been up to ever since. I've been trying to understand how to translate this science to the benefit of people that struggle. And God knows, Bill, there's, there's plenty of those. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. about half the human race. <laughs> yeah. Look, um, I think it's amazing that specifically the approach that you took was you came from the understanding that the brain is physically changing and as a result of that, it will adapt right. and allow for these new structures to occur. And therefore, anything that we need to, you know, enhance or, or create for somebody or help somebody create in their own brain right. um, is possible. So I think that was like a, a, a novel way to approach a problem like right. somebody can't read. In the past, people like that were just given the pop them on the shelf kind of treatment. They're never going to learn. They're always right. going to be that way. So it's amazing that this approach of neural processing got to that result. How did you track the progress? Obviously, they went from not being able to read to being able to read, et cetera, right. and communicate properly. But in the brain, did you guys have access to fMRI at that time in the early 90s that could show the changes Yes, we did, brain? Bill. Right. We recorded from brains in a number of ways, in fMRI and, and using evoked response strategies and, and uh, using positron emission tomography where you're looking with radioactive um, tracers of activity. And we could see the brain physically and functionally changing as we train it. So this is, you know, we now know on a, on a rich scientific basis that when you engage a brain and train it, first of all, you can define the brain of someone that's struggling whatever, for whatever reason. You can, you can record their, their weaknesses, their limitations in both behavioral terms and in, 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 in terms of the physical and functional brain. So you can document their specific, the specific basis of their, their problems. And then that defines a plan of attack for helping them, for guiding them, to be better and stronger again, to move in a normal word direction. And unlike medicine that's, uh, that's dependent upon gross, for example, chemical manipulation or, or shocking the brain in some way, which is the sort of high standards of current neurological medicine, which those are very crude strategies. Uh, and, and, you know, you're, the, the, they're based upon the principle that you're going to do something that distorts the brain in some way, and that will help you on the path to recovery. And that's crude in relation to identifying the faults and, and using this great natural asset, the plasticity of the brain, to drive the brain back in a normal word direction. Now you could say if there's ever a true cure of any neurological or psychiatric condition, that will come from you're engaging your brain to naturally drive it in a corrective direction. So it's not that this is easy to do. I mean, this is you might have to train a lot. And, uh, and maybe you can't get there all the way in practical terms in every person, certainly not when the brain is damaged. But you can make large-scale differences in a corrective direction in almost every individual that's struggling. And this is what we're trying to do in patient cohort after patient cohort. It's it's really amazing stuff. I um, 
I was in hospital recovering from my uh, brain surgery. Uh, as a result of it, uh, when I woke, uh, my left side uh, was numb. I had motor neuron and sensory neuron challenges. I had to learn right. how to walk again and reuse uh, right. and learn how to use my left arm again. Right. And in the time that I was waiting for the different rehab uh, exercises to occur and to be called down to rehab, um, if you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. I was watching videos of you delivering your, your speeches and I was watching uh, Paul Bakurita and uh, I was watching a whole yeah. bunch of other people. Yeah. Uh, right. And it occurred to me that if I meditate and imagine myself um, walking and using my arm again, that right. that will begin the process and it will be then not unfamiliar when I get down to the floor and right. start the walking. Right. Right. How does meditation and imagining oneself walking actually change the brain? Does it actually change the brain? Well, it was a wonderful insight that you had, Bill, because actually the machinery that involved that is engaged by mental practice is no different from the machinery that's re, that's involved in physical practice. It's exactly the same machinery. I mean, it just doesn't lead in the end stage. In other words, if I if I practice a, a manip, my man, manipulation of of in a progression in thought. I'm actually driving changes in my brain, just as if I practice them and, uh, and, and when I'm in, in action. People can imagine playing the piano and imagine playing a piano piece without ever moving their fingers. Mm. And then when they get down and put their hands on the piano keys, they're advanced because they have all of the benefit of that mental practice. So people can watch somebody juggling balls in front of them. And watching them juggling balls in front of them, of course, advances them substantially in actually picking up the balls and juggling it. In fact, you get at least as much advantage in imagining it as you do in actually playing, actually juggling. Oh. So, so people don't think of the, that mental practice has the power of physical practice, but it does, of course. I mean, you're, you're, you're sitting there, you're working on the solution of a problem, you're, you're exercising your brain in a very systematic and simple way. Of course, you're driving changes in, in the brain. And just in the same way, you're advancing it as if you're in a, engaged in any physical activity. Wow. So it's a great tool because it means it doesn't cost anything. It means you don't have to go anywhere <laughs> to do it. All, exactly. All you have to do is go into your own mind. And, and if you have yeah. somebody facilitate that in a guided meditation, for example, it's even easier. You can get one of those off YouTube for free. Yeah, well, actually, one of the sort of shocking things about brain training, in whatever form it's in, is that it's almost free. So it's because it's supported by technology. I mean, you can sit in front of a computer, in front of an iPad on a phone, and, and you can and you can uh, exercise your brain and uh, so and brain HQ, which is one of the programs that we apply widely in clinical populations. It's so inexpensive that people don't take it seriously. They say, well, you know, for you're telling me that I can have this uh, intensive training that could fix this for 30 bucks, you know, so come on. You know, they don't. If, if we said, well, this is the $5,000 treatment, we'd probably <laughs> convince them that it's really worth their time. But the fact is, is that it costs almost nothing to deliver it. And uh, not, it's inexpensive to make and cheap to deliver, you could say. So uh, that's another thing that 
ultimately, this will enable the delivery to everyone in the world, you yeah. could say, who yeah. needs help. And this, this is not, not that this is everything a person has to do. No. But this is a part, often a part of the solution. Yeah. Uh, with Brain HQ, I played those games early on as well. And um, the great thing about that is that it's, uh, it's able to calculate where I'm at and then show me you know, how far I've come and give me some information that you can't get from, uh, yeah. which, which I found was very helpful because I forgot to ask my family, my loved ones to pay attention to how far I'd come right. in my process. Right. And right. I often wasn't noticing that I had regained, you know, fine motor, motor, ch you know, changes in the ability of how I grabbed right. the fork or etc. So right. having somebody be able to remind me, even right. if it wasn't my relatives was great, because then I felt good about myself, I'd achieved something, yeah. I've come a long way. Well, one of the hardest things is to calibrate yourself. Yeah. And that it helps you calibrate yourself. I mean, you really want to know uh, how you're doing. You want to know how you're doing when you start, and you want to you know, know how things are progressing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's some. It's not. It's not totally positive. I mean, everyone reaches limits in whatever they do. But mm. so, but it's honest. And it's an on, honest calibration of how you're doing, and 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 uh, and that's that's a critical part of getting the most out of your brain. Yeah. Uh, many people talk about neuroplasticity in a positive light, but there's a negative side of neuroplasticity as well. Can we talk about negative neuroplasticity for a little bit? What sure. is it? Well, first of all, uh, it's plasticity is bidirectional. So, and it's a little bit of a complex thing to talk about, but you commonly do things in life that are self-destructive from a neurological point of view. An example is, is that many people, as they get older, develop very stereotypic behaviors. And actually, plasticity and uh, sustaining the richness of your performance abilities requires that you perform in, you know, with significant variety in how you do things. You know, so the more stereotyped you are, the more you sort of burn in uh, a, a simple way to do things, that's this is not healthy for you neurologically. Uh, an example of this is that let's say I'm an older person and I fall, and I realize I would I'm sort of in danger of falling, so I adjust the way I walk. I say I better I'm going to walk more carefully. Maybe I'm going to look down at my feet when I walk more often. And uh, so and so you're you're adopting a shuffling step that's more stereotyped, and you're commonly looking down because you're worried about hazards in front of you. Well, you're stereotyping your walking when you're older is exactly the wrong thing to do because it's that surprise, that bump, that, you know, the, uh, the, that little bit of uh, uh, the event that's unexpected that you need to adjust your posture to. Looking down at the ground means that uh, you're going to see things in near vision, and if you are bumped, Things are going to race in front of your eyes, and it's going to carry you right to the ground. But people do all kinds of things, and then you know you might you're walking with your knees bent a little bit. I mean, your walking is more exhausting. You're doing all kinds of things that assure that within a period of a year or two or three, you will not walk any longer. Mm. And people do all kinds of things like this that are that are self-destructive. Because another important aspect of this bill is that we've studied. The, we've studied the characteristics of the brain, its physical, functional, chemical characteristics near the end of life. And we've contrasted those, we looked at about 35 things that we contrasted with the brain in the prime of life. Let's say you're 30 versus 85. And you could ask, well, how many of those things are different? And the answer is they're all different. You say, well, how many of those things advantage the 85-year-old brain? None of them do on the statistical average, younger is better in everything you measure. And then you ask the question, well, how many of those things, those 35 or so things, can you reverse by training? And the answer is all of them. Everything is reversible. Or to put it another way, the progression to that 85-year-old state was plasticity. You couldn't call it positive. Mm. But I can now say, well, I'm going to train my brain when I'm 85, and I can drive everything in a positive direction. And it's because these processes are designed by the creator of the universe or Mother Nature to be bidirectional. And we, we've struggled with why it would be designed this way. Why are all of these things 
can we move them in a, a, a growing positive direction or, or do they all slide backward into a negative direction? And I think what, it, what it's all about is that the, the brain adjusts its machinery as a function of the noisiness of its operations. And when it's really refined and really sharp, it's got very low, little noise. And as a function of how you live your life, in the early part of life, coming up to the prime of life, you're in a learning phase, you're continually advancing your abilities, uh, and you reach a, a sort of high speed, high performance peak. And then you sort of rest on your laurels. You know, life, you're spending more time just uh, using the skills and abilities you develop when you were young, and, uh, and you're taking it easy quite a bit. You're not engaged very much in learning, new learning. You're not really sustaining your abilities very well. And as the noisiness creeps in, everything slows down and slowly deteriorates. So you got to live life with a certain level of energy, Bill. I mean, you got to, you got to use you gotta, it or lose it. Yeah. And, and so what it's, I think what we're trying to understand now is how can we help people manage this? Mm. So, you know, so from a young age, you're basically paying attention to, that's one of the things that I think the calibration on Brain HQ is, is helpful. I tell an older person, look, go to Brain HQ and then see how your performance relates to the performance of the average 30 or 40 year old. Hmm. If it's substantially deteriorated from their, their performance, get to work <laughs> and spend a little time and try to get there because 30 or 40 year olds are very seldom uh, moving directly into the home. They're not so likely to be demented. Mm. So there's no promise that you're, you'll be protected from that, but, but you'll, in all likelihood, you will be safer yeah. and you'll be, be up functionally more, more effective. And, uh, anyway, yeah, it's about moving in the right direction in some way, shape, or form. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's a good way to, way to put it. Moving in the right. Why would you ever choose not to move in the right direction? Yeah. And then it's also about you know changing the stereotype of oh well as you approach your seventies, these things start to happen. As you approach your eighties, these things start to happen, and so on. And it's just changing that stereotype to being different for somebody who is in the eighties. We talk about that a lot though, Doctor Merzenich, because. You know, we we'll often hear people say, you know, now 50 is the new 40 and 60 is right. the new 45. So right. I feel like we're actually making some progress in changing the stereotype as to what you're supposed to do when you get to 65, which in Australia is the retirement age. Right. People are going, well, I'm not going to stop working because I get to 65. They're looking for other things to occupy their time with. And I think that's right. a really good way to, uh, you know, combat you know, uh, early onset dementia or Alzheimer's or all those types of things. I agree. I think, but I, and, and sort of beyond that, what's really your, the brain is really asking you to do is to lead a life of continuous new learning. It's asking you to continuous, to continuously elaborate your skills and abilities, not to go into retreat. Mm. It's asking you to be continuously active and lively and not and not uh, move into onto the path of just taking it easy. Yeah. You know, it's asking you to re remain engaged and interested in and uh with your eyes wide open yeah. and your uh you know smelling and enjoying the world in front of you. You know, it's asking you to to basically maintain your connectedness with the world. Yeah. Fantastic. As we get to the end of the interview, um when I met you uh earlier this year uh I can change my brain in Melbourne, in Australia. Yeah. Um, I pulled you aside for a moment or two and we spoke about general anesthetic. Um, the reason why I'm interested in the topic of general anesthetic is because I, I experienced uh, a second surgery about 18 months after my brain injury and after the brain surgery. And when I woke from surgery, the deficits on my left side, the numbness, the motor sensory, you know, the the motor neurons and the sensory neurons, um, the deficits had increased and the numbness was worse and it was a big challenge to sort of understand what was happening to me. And I asked a lot, a lot of people, a lot of questions, including my doctors, and nobody could really give me any, of course, of course, any definitive answer. But 
I came to the understanding from some of the stuff that I studied and researched online that potentially anesthetic can influence the aging of the brain, especially uh, after brain surgery. Can you give us some insight into how it is that anesthetic causes some challenges in, in those areas? And is there some work being done to help combat that? Yeah, we've been extremely interested in this because there are, there are a rich variety of conditions in which the, and some of them in which the brain is injured. In, in surgical procedures or by uh, natural very, or a whole variety of natural disasters. Or uh, commonly people just go into surgery for whatever reason. Maybe it's an operation on their kidney or their heart or their whatever. And they go into the ICU after surgery, and as a consequence of this, their brain takes a big hit. They're, they're very substantially impaired cognitively. And in fact, if you go into surgery, go into the ICU, spend a day or two or three in the ICU, and uh, when you're out of it, when you're hallucinating, and when you're, that's this is a manifestation of of damage to what's called the blood-brain barrier. It's a manifestation of the fact that the brain normally keeps the the blood compartment sealed off from the brain tissues themselves, and and when the when the when the seal is broken there's an increase in the excitability of tissues in the brain. And that's what the hallucinations are all about. It's basically the brain being, being stimulating itself in this artificial way. And to make a long story short, you can both, recent studies show that you can both increase the resilience of this barrier before the surgery. So there's an indication that we could have trained you in a certain way before the surgery, increase the strength strength of this barrier, its resilience before this, and reduce the probability of these, these things happening to you. And also that we can train an individual after the surgery and substantially reduce the effects of the anesthesia and the surgery, the trauma that's occurred, that's reflected in your brain. So we're working hard on both of these issues, primarily with a research group at Vanderbilt University in the in the United States of uh, Tennessee, uh, uh, which is a wonderful medical research university, and uh, have been leaders in this area. But we're trying to sort out how to help people not have these sequelae, and we think that we can see an avenue in which that might be that might be achievable. Yeah. We have completed studies in which we've trained people have gone through what you've gone through, and very rapidly return them to normal not just in their behavioral science, but we appear to have restored this barrier separating blood from brain. Is this a physical barrier? Is it something that I can look at and touch or not? Well, it is physical in the sense that every little blood vessel in your brain has a seal. Uh -huh. So that not, no, no, nothing can, no, no significantly sized. And one of, the reason, one of the reasons the brain has this wonderful system of of keeping the blood out of the brain is that the brain is very subject brain tissue is very subject to infection mm. and when the barrier is strong no no virus no bacteria can enter it from blood so the brain is especially vulnerable to infection when 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 the barrier is leaky then bad elements from blood that can infect the brain can enter the tissues of the brain and what the brain does is it has a strategy of walling them off. It, it, it coats them with a chemical, which we call amyloid. Mm -hmm. And it creates what's called an amyloid body, which is a forerunner of Alzheimer's disease. So you do not want to go through this process, especially when you're a young guy like you, you know, create a condition in which this barrier is leaky and then have all these bad things leak into your brain and then have your brain create this, go through this process, which is really trying to protect itself. Right. Now, you're stable now, so you're beyond this. But a lot of older people are not very stable and uh, or people that are more fragile. And you do not want this to happen if it's avoidable. Hmm. It reminds me of the conversations that you hear people talking about the blood gut barrier. Yeah, right. And how you can get right. leaky gut. So are we talking right. about leaky brain? It's it's a very similar, very similar set of effects. Right. Very similar set of effects.
Right. And that's another really not very good thing to have happen to you. <laughs> yeah. I think I experienced a little bit of that uh, leaky gut scenario because as I healed my gut, I found that my recovery started to to accelerate. So my 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 head recovery started to accelerate. My sharpness of my mind, all those things came right. on board. Now, I know right. the gut has neurons in it as well, quite a large oh, yeah. amount. Yeah. Are we talking neuroplasticity happening in the gut? And, and I understand well, the heart has neurons as well. Right. The, 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 the primary, I mean, there are changes that can occur in the innervation of the gut or the, or the brain, but, but they're, they're also very strong. There are influences from the, from the uh, autonomic nervous system, and, and, and there, it's strongly influenced by uh, areas in the brain that are monitoring, they're receiving information from the gut, and they're monitoring it, and, and in, in some ways they're controlling the sort of end-stage manipulation of, of the nervous system from the autonomic nervous system to, to the gut. So you don't think of the brain as being involved in the health of the gut, but it is. Plasticity is primarily in the brain. It's receiving information, it's feeding back information. It's in the autonomic nervous system, receiving information, feeding back information. Mm -hmm. But it's, that's pla it's plastic. It can be strong or it can be weak. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've been actually doing is we've been, we've done this a lot in animal experiments, we're limited in what we've been doing in humans, but we actually train the brain in ways that increase the integrity and the uh, level of control of the autonomic nervous system on the cardiovascular system and the gut. So we're doing experiments now in which we're trying to change the biome in the gut for the benefit of individuals by changing the brain. So there, it's all, they're all linked together. No one, no one told the brain and the body, no one told the brain and the gut that they're not part of the same machine. Uh, I can, uh... There's some anecdotal evidence from me, at least, that you're on the right track. Uh, I love <laughs> I love hearing that the research is going down that path because it needs to be uh, a lot more understanding. You know, the challenge, one of the challenges when I was in hospital was the food that, that we were served. You know, food is not normally any good in hospital anyway, but I don't yeah. think it was supportive of uh, uh, the brain healing. Um, for example, you know, we were being served, you know, sugary, high, high sugary desserts and, you know, yeah carbohydrates and you know it was just very sort of challenging to sort of be able to understand like how am I going to eat this and and it's going right. to make me get out of rehab right. quicker and free right. up the spot for somebody else it wasn't doing that so I was getting mum and dad to bring food in for me specifically so that I wouldn't <laughs> have to eat it um, Bill I can tell I can tell I know from my conversations with you that you're a man of insight <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have insights if it wasn't people like you doing the work to give me these insights. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're but you're I'm, on the, you're you're pretty consistently on the right track. Uh, That's good. I'm trying hard. It's all about moving in the right direction, Doctor Mersenik. Right. Uh, it sure is. Uh, for life. For life, Bill. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> um, when I was researching you uh, for this interview, I found a photo of you online with the Dalai Lama. Oh yeah. What are you chatting yeah, with Dalai Lama about? Well, I've had the pleasure of being invited to have a conversation with him a couple times, and and uh, and I find it, find it to be astounding, experience, a wonderful experience. I I, I tried to I've tried to explain to people that uh, if you imagine that you're in a room in which there were a thousand people, everyone would know where he was, and it was, wouldn't be because he's saying anything. You just know it. Hmm. So I found it to be a very uh, wonderful and inspirational experience. And of course, there's probably nobody uh, that I've met who's more good hearted than he is. Hmm. You know, he, he defines good heartedness. He's, he's, he's honed his empathy towards other people. And, you know, it's one of my own ideas in life is that we're here as a, uh, for uh to not just to live our life for the benefit of ourselves, but but we're we're actually designed to be with others and helping them, mm. and we're designed to be 
uh, helping everyone in our tribe and beyond it that we can. So, and he embodies that to me. So that's a wonderful experience. And then the other thing about him is great is, is that he's open. He listens. Mm. He, you know, he, he, he would say that, uh, and he seeks understanding of science. He would say that if science contradicts his beliefs, he's got to reconsider how he's thinking about things. Now, that's a pretty enlightened way to think about your approach to uh, your understanding of the deepest things or most important things in the world yeah. and beyond. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, so glad that you shared that part of the, the story. Um, you, we've touched on the heart a number of times in, in our conversation. And when I met you um, earlier this year, I uh, bought a copy of your book, uh -huh. Softwired. It's a great name, by the way. And I asked you to sign it and you signed it for me and you, your message was quite profound. And it said, enjoy and take to heart. Hell, yeah. For me, that was really interesting. When we're talking to somebody who right. uh, talks about the brain all the time, your message was to enjoy and what you've written for me to take to heart. Yeah. I think that's a really you, powerful I, message. And it seems to me that maybe you have. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's, that's good. <laughs> that's great. So I hope that the people listening and watching will look more into what it means to take something to heart. And if right. it's a positive thing that you're taking to heart, it's going to enhance and accelerate, you know, good feelings and uh, great times on the planet. If you're taking negative things to heart, you're going to potentially accelerate feeling of pain and other things. So, we want to make sure we take the right things to heart. Absolutely. Absolutely. Why would you live your life in misery? And why would you live your life accepting, in a sense, the, the, a downhill slide when you can continue to grow and be a better and stronger person? You know, everyone can have a better life next month or next year because they've been endowed with a plastic brain. They can actually be stronger and more effective and, and have deeper understanding and, and ultimately greater wisdom. Or, or they can continue to slip and slide mm -hmm. and uh, into uh, increasing insignificance. So I strongly recommend a life of personal growth and, uh, and self-development and, and, and with happy spirit. Yeah. I strongly recommend it. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you and learn from you directly. It's just amazing the work that you do. I really thank you for doing that work. I thank not only you and all the teams that you've worked with and all the people that have done that work because without them, I don't think that we would be anywhere near uh, being able to at least kind of explain what it is that we can do to help ourselves and know it as a patient know you know, what I can do rather than just be told by a doctor, do this or do that. That's so, wonderful. Wonderful to see you again, Bill, and, uh, and see that you're doing so well. Discover how to heal your brain after stroke. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The Content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation 
education program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy, currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.